Good morning. My name is Chris McIntosh, Director of Public Safety Industries for ESRI, and I'd like to welcome you to the next installment of ESRI's Fire and Emergency Services webinar series, and today we're going to talk about what's new in pre-incident planning solutions. The purpose of this webinar series is to provide updates on how to use ArcGIS to support fire and emergency services from various members of our public safety team. We established a regular cadence of these so you can plan ahead and hopefully put these on your calendar. Um, so the next webinar, I already marked this down, will be November 15th, conducting fire safety surveys with ArcGIS. These webinars are recorded and links for the resources and the webinar itself will be sent out afterwards. If you've missed a previous webinar, you can always go to the fire industry webpage and watch those recordings. Topics will vary. They could be broad an overview of the, the use of GIS for, for fire response, for example, or it could be in depth where we focus on a particular application or template like we are today. We're always soliciting input for topics, so please, if you have something that you would like us to focus on during one of these webinars, let us know and we'll, we'll put that on the agenda for, for future events. So today's topic, what's new in pre-incident planning solution, we're very lucky to have Walter Potts, ESRI solution engineer, who, who's one of the brains behind building these things, uh, and it goes out and gathers requirements and builds these solutions. Uh, so he is the, the expert on, on these tools. He's joined by Chris Fox, also from the solutions team. And Jim Long, a senior GIS analyst from the Northwest Fire District, is kind enough to join us today and share his experience. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Walt, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Very good. Thanks a lot, Chris. Welcome everybody, uh, good morning to you all. I think it's still a morning for most of you anyway. Uh, so yeah, as, as Chris mentioned, they we're gonna go through the free incident planning. Uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about what's coming up in this webinar here. The first thing we're gonna do is just do an overview of the fire solutions that are, that are available to you. Uh, we'll introduce to you the new pre-incident planning workflow. Uh, and then we're gonna do a demonstration of each one of the pre-incident planning solution applications that are available to you. And then show you how you can deploy them through the new solution deployment tool. Uh, and then, as, as Chris mentioned earlier, we have uh, fortunate to have Jim Long with us from Northwest Fire District, who's going to give a testimony of how they've been using this tool, the pre-incident planning uh, applications, and how they've implemented them. Uh, and then we'll finish up with some question and answers towards the end. And I just want to make a note here that Chris Fox is monitoring those questions in the chat window. So if you have questions throughout the webinar, you can go ahead and submit them via the, the uh, question the chat box there. And he'll answer them as we go. And then we'll, well, the questions that we have not answered, uh, we will finish up at the end then. So that's a little bit about what's coming. So let's get started with it. Uh, the first thing you should know is that the uh, pre-incident planning solution, as well as all the other solutions, uh, are um, uh, available to you. Uh, they're through the local government solution uh, application and program. Uh, they are a collection of useful maps and apps. You'll see there are very uh, several of them uh, for fire. Uh, they are configuration then of all the extensible maps and apps that you have available to you. Um, I should also mention to you that um, these, uh, all of these apps are free. Uh, they are supported through tech support. Uh, they also include workflows that we've implemented from community users like Jim, which you're going to see a little bit later on this morning. Including all those are best practices, what works, what doesn't work, some new implementation ideas, which really resulted in this new version. Uh, the pre-incident planning solution. And it also incorporates a network of services from both ESRI and from partners to help you implement those solutions and then make enhancements to them as well. So all of this is part of the ArcGIS for Solutions for Local Government. In this team, the ArcGIS for Local Government team, the mission for us is to try to help our users deliver map and, maps and applications quickly throughout your organization. And that's what you're gonna see here today. Uh, we also want to help you stay current with future releases to avoid getting stuck in legacy technology. So as the next version of ArcGIS comes out, we will make changes to these applications uh, so that you don't have to spend your time doing that, keeping them up to date. We also want to help you unlock the entire ArcGIS platform so it can be used by many different people. And this application that you're going to see here today is that we are using pre-incident planning across the entire fire department by many different uh, users. And that's an example of us trying to open up the platform so it can be leveraged by many different people, not just the GIS experts in your organization. And we also want to, to leverage the collective knowledge of the entire community, including those best practices and in industry tradecraft. As you will see here, we've included some of this stuff from uh, the NFPA and so on in these solutions. 
So here is a broad look at all of the solutions that are available to you through RGS for Local Government. In the orange, you can see the different communities that we support. Uh, there's quite a few different solutions. We update these a couple times a year. The ones that are in red are the ones that we're going to be discussing here today. So let's get started then in the pre-incident planning. I call this the version 2.0 because there, those of you that uh, may be familiar with the solutions may be realized that there was a pre-incident planning uh, version that we uh, created a few years ago. Um, and this version incorporates all the feedback that we've gotten on that first version, including changes to the technology and business needs. Uh, the previous version was desktop based, which means that only one person could use it at a, at a time, which was a great step forward that you could do digital pre incident planning, but again, it was locked to down to one user. Uh, this version follows the NFPA. Those, are, those of you that are familiar with the National Fire Protection Association uh, has a set of documentations. This one's called 1620, and it has recommended best practices for in, uh, pre incident planning, which you can see the quote that I put down there in the bottom. Uh, basically, this workflow involves a, a systematic process with uh, several different people within the organization. And the roles uh, may vary, the person uh, that may be doing them, but the steps are pretty much the same. The first step, of course, is to identify and assign buildings that, uh, where you need to put a pre-incident plan. And then, of course, to go out uh, to those buildings, collect that information, prepare it, and distribute that information so that it can be shared amongst the organization. Uh, third, then, is to review and evaluate those pre-incident plans, and then last of all is use those plans that you've created for either training purposes or in response for decision making. So therefore, the um, applications that have been created support that workflow. Uh, down here on the left corner, you'll see that we have that pre-incident plan coordinator application, which can be used um, to be able to go in and identify where pre-incident plans should be created and assign them to your station and shift crews. Uh, next is the uh, field inventory application, which is a mobile-based application, which allows users to go out in the field once they've been assigned uh, those pre-incident plans to be able to go out and collect them, collect that data associated with each plan. Uh, then over on the right, you'll see that there's a dashboard where a fire chief or someone else can go in and monitor the progress of the pre-incident planning program. And then last of all, you can use those using the pre-incident plan locator. Uh, so again, this shows you the variety of different applications that are used. Each one of these uh, can be used by different people within the organization, depending on their role. All right, so that's enough talking about it. Let's see it. So I'm just going to go into a demonstration here so you can see um, what we're talking about. We'll start off with the pre-incident plan locator. Uh, I'll go through each one of these applications, and then I'm going to show you where you can go to get these apps. Uh, so the first one in is pre-incident plan locator application, and this could be used if you're someone like a, a battalion chief or a command staff uh, member that's uh, responsible for assigning pre-incident plans. Uh, you could use this application. Um, this application can work on uh, any device. Uh, it uses the web application builder uh, uh, apps uh, with the ArcGIS. So if I want to, I could just come in here and type in an address. Uh, that might be a good way to do that. Uh, select which whatever plan I want. I might also want to start off with just assigning them as a coordinator. So the first thing I might want to do is to come in here and say, okay, well, where are pre-incident plans right now? And we give you a number of search tools that you can use. The first one is the last inspected. So you can specify a date when it was last inspected to see if there are any that are overdue and select apply. And it'll give you then a list of all those pre-incident plans that maybe be past due or past a certain date. Another way you can find which buildings uh, might be uh, needed for a pre-incident plan is to select by construction type. So if you're an organization where you want to select a certain type of, of like let's say wood frame construction perhaps, uh, to do those first, maybe those are high priority, then you can select and it'll give you a list of those in your organization. A third way to do it is by status. I might want to say, well, which ones are just simply not assigned? And so I select on apply and then it gives me a list. Then of course, I can go through there and click on each one of them. And then the last method that we have on here is to select by the station assignment. So I might want to go here and go ahead and select station seven on the list here, apply that and find out which uh, buildings have been assigned to that station. I should mention that there are other things you could uh, add on there if you wanted to. You can configure uh, that search widget to be able to just find things like uh, risk if you have risk assigned to each one of your buildings. Okay, so I've searched here for uh, those 
buildings, the screens and the plans uh, that have been assigned to station shut seven. Uh, so I can click on each one of them. I can see here, this one here has been approved and it gives me some information about that particular assignment. Uh, it also tells me that there's an attachment to it. I can also select uh, for ones that are under review. Uh, again, this one, maybe they've gone out and collected information, but it has not been approved yet. So there's a couple different ways you can do that. So you can find some information about each one of the plans. As I zoom out here just a little bit, uh, you'll see that there are a number of other features that are on the map that have been collected already for these two particular buildings that have been assigned. So I'm just gonna click on a couple of those here so you can see what they are. And the first one here is a alarm control panel. And you can see that uh, station seven, uh, shift A has gone out, collected information about that alarm control panel, and they've added in some information about the location description, the floor number, and so on. You can also see that we've uh, they've located where the uh, FDC connect is to the building, uh, so they know where to run their lines, their hoses, and they've also added some information about that particular one. You can you could also attach pictures if you needed to. We have some uh, shutoff valves. In this case, we have a gas shutoff uh, that they've located for us on that building. Uh, some other things that are on the list as well as like a key box so they can get in in case the place is locked uh, at night, so they want to know where that key box is located. Uh, that can also be added to the map. And then there's a few other things in here, such as like uh, this hazardous materials. They've given us some information about the uh, hazardous location of uh, a facility here. Um, so they can get some information on that. And as you can scroll down here, you can also get attachments like a picture. If you wanted to take a picture of this uh, uh, brewing facility and where the tanks are located, so you could uh, pro provide that information onto the crews that are gonna be responding to that building. Uh, so there's several different uh, things that we've been collecting on here. Another one are the uh, occupancies. One of the changes we made to this version that we did not have in the previous version is a feature class called occupancies, which allow the guys out in the field to be able to collect that information. In this case here, we have a building that's in a strip mall and we have several different uh, commercial tenants in this particular building. And so we wanna be able to identify which ones uh, have had a preemptive plan and perhaps this uh, means that we would go inside that tenant uh, space and collect any information such as that hazardous uh, materials that we saw earlier. So that's a little bit about some of the features that can be collected. Now, let's just say that I want to be able to go ahead and assign a couple of uh, these buildings, new buildings, to a station. So how would I go about that? So I can use this edit widget up here to select out one of the particular buildings and I can select them one at a time or multiple buildings. And I'll start off with this one, one at a time. And as I select on this particular building, assign it to a particular uh, station and shift crew, you can see that it's already got the full address which came along uh, with the information from the uh, building. Uh, now I can simply just select off the list if I have a list of what station I want. So I can select station seven and perhaps I wanna assign this one to uh, station A to keep it consistent. And then I can say a date. So I'll tell them what date I want this pre incident plan to be assigned on. And I'll just uh, go down here and select, I'll give them a couple months here uh, so they can get to it whenever uh, they have time when they're not in service. And then I'm gonna change the status to assigned and save that. So now I've just assigned that particular uh, building to, uh, to that station. Now I should mention that you can go in here and select multiple of them if you want to. So I'm just gonna scroll out here and select a couple of them. And as I do that, I could go in and select uh, the same station to inspect or go and do prints in a plan on multiple buildings. Uh, so that's another way that you can do that. Okay, so this is nice when I have a building to select like this here, you can see that I have the building footprint and I could select that and say, okay, then we want somebody to go and do this to that to prints in a plan. But what if I don't have uh, building footprints like this that I can't that I can select. So I could create them. So there's a couple ways you can do that. Uh, there's a manual way that you can use um, doing this tool here, which allows me to go in and set some preset values. So I'm just gonna scroll up to this area right up here, and we're gonna go ahead and create a couple of new pre of plans, and then we'll assign them. And you'll notice over here on the screen on the right side that I have the name of the complex. So these three buildings here might be part of the same complex. If they are, they might be a university campus. It could be a medical facility or something else that I want to assign all these buildings as part of the same complex. Then I can assign them to a specific station and shift crew and then a due date and then change the status to assigned. Now when I come up here and click on the tool, it just allows me to go over to that particular building and just draw around it. 
It won't be the most accurate, but it'll be good enough. And as I uh, close that polygon, now I've just created a building footprint and I can go ahead and give some information about that particular building. If I have a uh, occupancy permit that I can draw from, I could fill out some information. I could indicate whether there's a plan ID or not or a plan name. Uh, it looks like the address has already been, the complex I should say, has been filled in for us from that uh, preset value. And then the full address, I can go ahead and put in the address and location description. It gives me a list of fields here so I can put input contact info if I have that information. And then some information about the building. Again, if I have an, an occupancy permit that I can use, I can enter that information from that as well in the year bill. And then there's a, a series of drop down uh, selections where I can select the NIFRS code for the National uh, Incident Fire, National, uh, I think it's called Incident Fire Response System. Uh, it allows me to select a code that I want to assign to that particular building. So depending what type it is, in this case, uh, might be a mercantile or a business of some sort. And there's a fire load. Uh, depending on what's inside that building, perhaps there's furniture or something like that. So I might want to assign it as, assign it as a high fire load. And then the construction type, I could say oh, it's ordinary construction perhaps. Uh, the roof type, you can select from a list of different types of wood. Uh, in this case, we might say that it's concrete on a metal deck perhaps, I'm not really sure. Um, and then the roof cover, what's on top of that, maybe it's a, a metal roof. Uh, and then wall types, if, whether or not there's a basement, there's a series of yes, no questions in here. Whether or not the building has, is sprinkled, is it's been set up with a sprinkle system whether or not there's a key box and a water supply and so on. And then again, you can see the, the station shift and the due date have already been pre-filled for me from the preset values from the previous screen. I can include all that information in there and then save that and then go and create another one. The nice thing about using this tool as I go back to it is I don't have to enter in that preset information. It's already got that in, in, in there. Um, I should also mention that you can pre-configure this. If you want to add more information than I've just put uh, in this few fields, you can add more fields to be preset, so you don't have to enter them uh, every time. So it makes it uh, pretty easy to use uh, the application. Okay, so we have then several buildings that have been assigned to particular station and shift crews. Uh, now we want to be able to show you what you do next. Uh, how would I go about collecting, which is the next step in the workflow that NFPA recommends? So to do that, I'm just going to bring up my uh, mobile device. And I have here, if I am a fire station uh, crew member uh, that's in station seven and I've been assigned these stations, I could use a mobile device like my iPhone here to be able to go out and collect that information on site. Uh, so here I've already got the uh, web app, the web map I should say, uh, downloaded onto my iPhone. And the reason I do that is because I might need to go offline if I need to go inside the building, inside a fire, uh, inside of a um, stairwell or something like that where I might ha not have connectivity. So that's what you see here with these two uh, uh, double arrows, they, uh, meaning that you can sync it, uh, you can go offline and you can sync it. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna open up this map and you can see that I've already zoomed into this area here where this particular uh, pre incident plan that's been assigned to me. So if I just click on it, open it up, I can get the details uh, for this pre incident plan. And again, if I'm on site then, you can see that the plan ID and the name has been put in there for me the address, I can go ahead and collect some information. If I'm on site and I wanted to, I could put in the contact name, phone, email, and some other information about it. Uh, you can see then that the NIFRS code uh, and all the other information has been entered in here. So you can enter all this information into it as you need to. So we're just gonna go back um, back to the, to the map. And I wanted to show you also as I zoom in here, the other features that show up uh, the, you can see that I've got the, the scale threshold set so that as I zoom in, I see more information. And this is really important. If I am standing in front of this building, I wanna zoom in and see what's there. So the next thing I might wanna do is add a couple of features. Uh, so I click on the plus sign and it brings up a whole set of uh, features that I can add to the map. And you can see here, I have a number of different types of alarm control panels. I have building information like building access at our ad access basement access, where the fire escapes are, and so on. If I scroll down here, I can see there's a set of uh, symbols here for connection points for the fire department, uh, whether I've got a riser uh, or sprinkler valve, control valves, and so on. Uh, maybe there's a suppression control panel that I wanna put in there. There's where you can see the hazardous symbol that I can add to the map, the key box, and so on. 
I'm going to scroll down so you can see what some other things in here. Here's where I can add the occupancies, the utility shutoffs. We also have in here like fire hose line if you want to draw in where the hose lines need to go inside the building or outside the building from the pumper to the FDC point. Or I can just actually create a new pre incident plan here in this as well. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back and I want to add a uh, uh, key. So I'm going to start right in front and put a key box. Uh, and I'm going to add that to the map. So I can type in like floor number and stuff like that. So let's put in floor one. And location description, I'll just say front door, something easy. Because that's where it would be most of the time. It's telling me I've got poor accuracy because I'm indoors as I'm giving this demo. Now I'm going to click on the map and just drop a point or uh, somewhere where I would be, hit submit. And now it's saying it's storing that on the device. So because I've gone, I have this in disconnected mode, I can go inside the building, collect a bunch of information that might be uh, hazardous materials or something like that in, the, in that building. And then when I click on maps, you can see then it tells me how many new features are waiting to be synced. So all I have to do then, oops, let's say sync, and you can see it's beginning that sync process and it's going to load that key box uh, into my map online. And so as that's syncing up, I'm gonna go back to my map and show you how else we can use this. All right, so we have two of them that we've covered so far. How do you assign pre-incident plans? How do you go out into the field and collect it on your mobile, mobile device? Uh, the next application we wanna show you is the pre-incident plan dashboard. And this application is very helpful for someone like a chief uh, that might want to monitor how the entire pre-incident plan program is going. What progress are we making on them? So you can see I have on this dashboard a number of pre-incident plans. You can see the, the ones that have been assigned but not completed are red. Those that are under review are in orange and those that are uh, approved are green. Uh, I also can select on each one of these individual ones and get some information about that particular plan. You can see here's the information about the type of roof, uh, number of floors, and so on. This, of course, can be configured to give you, uh, your chief, just the necessary information they want, whatever is important to them. You can see that the attachments just show up. So if we've taken a picture of that building uh, right in front of it, you will see that information. So I select on another one here. I get some more information about that one. And in this case here, on a, they have attached a picture of the layout. I should mention that one of the common things is when you're uh, on site doing a pre-incident plan with your mobile device, when you walk inside the front door of a building, quite often they'll have a building layout or at least the, the floor plan for that particular floor that you're on. Happens quite often in hotel rooms and so on. And a user can simply just use their phone to or their mobile device to take a picture of that layout and attach it to that particular building. And it just shows up in all the applications because it's been synced. So that's a pretty handy tool to have. Uh, the next thing I might want to do is get a bigger picture, a wider view of it, and just say, well, how many uh, pre incident what's the status of each one of these? So there you can see that there are uh, three of them that are under review. We have one that's been approved, and we have uh, uh, four more that have been assigned that uh, they've not, not been completed yet. So we can kind of get a status of where we're at. We might want to also look at where we are on the distribution of our pre incident plans. So we've done here in this, this graph just tells us the number of uh, pre incident plans that have been assigned to each particular station. And I see that I've assigned four of them to station seven so far. So it gives you an idea about where the distribution of those are. The next panel just gives us a high level overview. Okay, how many of them are in progress at this moment in time? How many of them are past due so we can see where we're at? Do we need to have more people going out uh, collecting that information? Uh, it just gives you an overview of, of where we're at. All right, so that's the third application. And it gives us some ideas about um, uh, the big picture of where we're at with the program. The last application I want to show you is the pre-incident plan locator, which is the one I started with. Uh, and then this one, again, can be used either a training exercise or could be used in response. So if I'm battalion chief or someone else uh, that I'm responding to a call at, let's say, 4020 uh, Fox Valley Center Drive, I can just enter that address or I can just click on the map if I want to. And it shows me where I'm responding to. And it shows me a list of the pre incident plans that are in a particular location. And then if I just click on one, again, it gives me the necessary information about that tells me what the floor plan is and also tells me where the key box, what the occupancy is. And by the way, there's a hazard in here so I can warn my guys about that if I want to. I can also look at um, adjacent facilities to see what might be there uh, so we can see if we have some issues there in case the fire spreads. 
So it's a pretty simple app. Uh, you can change, you know, how big of an area you want to search for uh, manually if you want to. And again, you can just click off the map. Again, these applications can be used on any device. So it could be an iPad or some other device that you want to use. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of the four apps. And as I um, uh, covered earlier, that these apps can be used by different people in the organization to be able to collect all the information that's available to you. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is show you where you can go to get started on these applications. So to do that, we're going to start right here at solutions.arches.com. This is the probably uh, one of the most important things for you to remember from this webinar is the this URL address here. So you can go to this website to find this solution as well as all the rest of them for the fire service. And the way you can use this is you simply just scroll down the page and you can see there's a list of different uh, industries in here. And we're going to select local government. In here, you'll see all the different departments for local government. And if I scroll over here to the right, one of them is the fire service. And so on this fire service page, you'll see a list of all the solutions that are available to fire service uh, fire departments around the country. Um, you can see that there's some in here for mapping incidents. There are some for identifying target hazards, which could feed right into your uh, pre-incident plans. Uh, there's some for opioid epidem epidemic, if, for those of you that are involved in that. Things for creating like wall maps, run books, uh, fire inspections, uh, fire hydrant inspections, uh, AED inspections, and so on. Uh, so there's a whole list of them that you can see here, including the fire safety survey, which we've covered in the next webinar in November. Uh, so there's a number of solutions that are available to you here on the fire service page. So I'd recommend that you go and check these out and see what you can do with them. So we're going to do a start off with the uh, pre plan just to give you an overview of where you can go with that. And as I go into this page, it gives me a list then of the four apps that I just showed you. And I scroll down and I want to look at, let's say, pre, uh, coordinate the uh, pre-incident plans. Uh, the first thing I can do is select the view application and it takes me into it so I can see what this application looks like, much like what I just showed you in the demo. So that's how you can see what the application does. So it gives you kind of a live view and how to use it. But let's say I like it, I want to do more with it. So I click on the learn more and you'll see that every one of these solutions has been documented pretty much the same way. Uh, on the home tab there, you can see there's an overview. It tells you a little bit about the solution, what it does, uh, and uh, who, who can use it. It gives you a list of requirements. So if I click on the requirement tabs, there's the requirements in here if you're deploying it with the deployment solution deployment tool or if you're going to do it manually. Also tells you what you get when you deploy this particular solution, what applications and maps and feature layers that are included with it. Uh, it also tells me what's new. So again, it gives me a history of this particular solution and you can see that uh, we just released it in March. Next thing I might want to do is click on the get started uh, with principal planning and you can see then it tells me, all right, so there are two ways that I can get started. There's an automated way through the solution deployment tool and then there's a manual way. So I'm going to show you the manual way first and then I'm going to show you the easy way with the solution deployment. So the first thing uh, I'd want to do is click on the publish feature layer. So this tells me, all right, the first thing I need to do is publish a feature layer into my organizational account. Now that organizational account could be online or it could be using portal on your server. And as I scroll down here, it tells me the steps I need to go through to be able to publish this feature layer. And one of them is to be able to publish a new hosted feature layer of the pre of plans. If I click on that link, it takes me to a service catalog for that particular layer and it gives me all the information about that layer. So there's a description in here, it tells me what layers involves. Those are the layers that I showed you earlier. Uh, all the different, uh, and if I come up here to the data tab, select on that, it tells me a little bit about the schema, tells me what fields are in here, and it kind of gives me a list of those. And I can also click on the visualization, uh, which shows me a map of it. And what the helpful thing here is it gives me a list of all the different uh, layers and the symbols that are in that particular layer. So as I scroll down the list here, I can go down to key boxes, for example and get a list of the symbols for that uh, layer, key boxes. All right, so that kind of gives you an overview of the feature layer that's included with this. And that's the first step, of course, is to publish that feature layer. That's an empty feature layer that you would publish in your organizational account. The next step it walks you through is how to configure that feature layer. So I might want to change that schema. Maybe there's some fields, additional fields for the building uh, that I want to put in there. Perhaps I don't want to have the building size uh, other features in there. So I can go ahead and export that hosted feature layer uh, and then download it, open it up in our catalog or ArcGIS Pro 
and modify that schema if I choose to, add fields, delete fields, do things like that. Or I could just use the append tool as it suggests here and load data into that layer once I've uh, configured it, modified it. All right, so now that I have configured it, I have modified that layer according to my specific needs, the next step in the process is to create a map, a web map. So I have this feature layer that I've published, I've pre-configured it, maybe even loaded my data into it, that layer. Now I can create a map from it, and this step walks through the process of how to create that map, and it gives you some information that you can use for like the tag or the summary or the description and so on. So now I have a web map, and the last step I'd need to do is configure that application, and this particular documentation walks you through that process of how you create that application. And all these steps that you see in here are basically um, following the example that you see when you click on the view application, so the live example. So there's a number of steps in here. So you can follow those steps, so that's one way you can do it. An easier way, as I mentioned earlier, is you could simply just use the deployment tool, this new solution deployment tool. And that is a add-in to ArcGIS Pro that you can download and use. And as it says, it gives you the instructions about how you can install it. There's a link here that you can download. You log into your Esri account. It's a free add-in, so you can just click on it, and it walks you through the process of uh, using it. How do you install it? Once I've got it installed, then it walks me through the process of how I can deploy solutions. And there's many different solutions that can be deployed with this one tool. So once you've installed it, uh, that you're done. You don't need to do that again. It can be used multiple times for multiple different solutions. And then you can uh, go through the process of actually configuring that particular solution. So it walks you through that. And then it also has uh, tools in there for you to load your data. So the best way to do that is to show you the tool. So I'm going to open up ArcGIS Pro here. And I've got this map here that has my sample data in it that you showed for the pre-incident planning. And what, once I've installed the uh, deployment tool, it's available to me through the share tab. So I simply just click on the share tab, and then you'll see it over here to the right where it says ArcGIS Solutions Deploy. And you can see that the tool shows up, uh, and there's a number of tasks that are in this particular uh, tool. And one of them is to sign in. So it walks you through the steps of what do you have to do to sign into your organizational account, whether it's in ArcGIS Online or uh, into your uh, portal. And so I've done that, I've logged in. And the next step is simply hit this the deploy uh, button. Once I do that, then it's searching through my organizational account and finding all of the solutions that I have already deployed into my organization. So if I click on local government here, it gives me a list then of all the applications that are available to me. And you can see that I've already installed some of them. Some of them I have not uh, deployed yet. Another way I can do it is just to simply come up here and type in pre-incident planning and it gives me a list of those applications. The green check mark means that I've already uh, deployed that, and if I click on it, it just takes me to that particular location in my organizational account. So these are the applications that I've already installed. Uh, I could select on multiple ones if I had not installed them, and I can select the output folder wherever I want to put them, and I hit uh, deploy, and then it takes those applications that are pre-configured for you, uh, it takes the web maps that, again, have been pre-configured with web maps, with the pop-ups, uh, the symbology, all that, and the layers that I showed you a few minutes ago. All that gets deployed into the organization all at once, and you can do multiple apps at the same time if you want to. So I've already done that, as you can see. So I'll just click Finish. The next step, then, is if I want to, I could go ahead and configure these uh, particular solutions to meet my specific organization's needs. So if my chief has told me, hey, I'd like you to add this field in here for risk, perhaps, for example, I would be able to do that. So then I would come into there and uh, configure that particular application, add any fields that I want to for risk, for example. You can see you can specify what table you want to add that, what type of field, if there's an alias, and any domain. Um, the nice thing about domains, as I will show you here, is you, you can go in and modify them. Now, if you're not familiar with domains, uh, the domain allows you to do is generate a pick list. Uh, so earlier you saw I had things like um, I could select the type of building or the type of roof or the type of NIFRS code. Those were all using a domain type. And so if you have a field that you want to add in here, like let's say I want to create a risk uh, field and I'm going to assign them risk um, one, two, three, or something like that, I could create a domain in there for that risk field and just give it values, coded values like one, two, and three, and it would make an uh, easy pick list, or I could make something a little bit more complicated if I wanted to. So that's a good way for you to be able to configure your solution. 
and modify it as you need to. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show you in the deployment tool is actually maybe one of the more useful things. Uh, once I have deployed this solution, I've configured it the way I want to add it in my fields and my domains and so on. Uh, one of the very important things I might want to do is load data into it. So I've already configured it, got the fields the way I want them. So I could do that by selecting off first what data I want to go in here. This is really helpful for the pre-incident planning so that if I have building footprints, I could load them into my target data set and I'll just click on this browse button here and go to my organizational uh, account online and go into pre-incident planning and here's where I have my fire pre-incident plans. This is the feature service that was published earlier and here's all the layers that we talked about earlier. So if I scroll down here, I can click on pre-incident plans. And what this does then, it allows me to load all the building footprints that I may have gotten from the assessor's office or some other department in my local government and load them into the pre of plan layer so I don't have to create them manually. Next, I want to be able to map out the fields. So if the assessor's office or whoever gave me the, uh, the building footprints don't match the pre of plan uh, schema that I have, I could, be, I could then uh, match up those fields, perhaps like full address or something like that, maybe they don't call it full address, to a different field in my list here. So I would add that and it would tell it what field to take that address and put it into. So then I could run that if I needed to and it would be able to uh, load that data into my uh, feature class. Then the last thing I might want to be able to do is to calculate a field. And this could be good if I have just loaded the, the building footprints into my pre-incident planning application and I want to assign all those new buildings as unassigned until I use the coordinator app to go in and specifically assign them to a individual station. So that I could just go in and select that table and that field uh, for uh, assign the status and, and uh, calculate that to the word unassigned and all of them would be uh, assigned the same thing at the same time. So it makes it pretty handy. So you can see then that the solution deployment tool can be very handy for not only deploying pre-configured applications into your org with the web maps and the applications, but once you've done that, be able to modify them and then load your data into them. All right, so now we've covered quite a bit of ground. I wanna go back to our, um, oops, our, our um, excuse me here to our PowerPoint and talk a little bit about that solution deployment tool again. Um, as I mentioned, it's a new add-in to ArcGIS Pro uh, and that it can be used uh, to deploy any solution, as I mentioned there, into your ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online or Enterprise Organization. Um, it includes the set of tasks to guide you through that deployment process. You don't have to use all those steps, but you can use some of them. I mentioned the, the one, the task for adding fields and domains, and then it can load, you can use to load your feature service and, uh, and your map output, map the output fields. So it's a very important tool for you to know about as you're deploying any of these solutions for your fire department. Uh, so that's kind of a high level overview of the apps for pre-incident planning and how you can deploy them into your organization. I wanna change gears here now and introduce you to a, a friend of mine who's gotten to be a friend of mine, one of our users from Northwest Fire District in Tucson, Arizona is uh, Jim Long, he joins us today on, on the phone. And I don't believe Tom is with us yet, Jim, today. I think he's, he's uh, working, he's, he's a firefighter, he's, he's, uh, he's uh, in service right now. Uh, but I wanna tell you a little bit about this organization first uh, before uh, Jim and I start talking about how they've used the pre-incident planning tools in their organization. Um, as you can see here in the map, that in this past user conference uh, in July, they received a special achievement award from Esri for their work with a couple of different applications that they uh, did last year, including the uh, two initiatives was interactive map for informing citizens uh, if they were within the fire district boundary, which is a great way to reach out to your citizens. And another one to streamline the district's fire hydrant location inspection program, which is pretty innovative as well. So they re received a special achievement award for that work. This year, uh, they've been partnering with me for the last six months or so to work on the pre-incident planning applications. And part of it is to identify what are the requirements for these applications and how they should work, what's the correct workflow, as I mentioned earlier, um, to do that. And then uh, what are some of the issues with deployment? So uh, that's kind of an introduction to Jim. Um, you there with me, Jim? Yes, sir, I'm here, Walter, thank you awesome. for the intro. Thank, thank you for taking the time to, to uh, to join us today. Uh, the part of the reason I wanted Jim to join us is to him to tell you 
uh, a little bit about what they have been doing with the 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 application and perhaps maybe some things that you all can learn from. So Jim, why don't you give us a little bit of background about the Prince and a Plan uh, application when you deployed it and how are you using it? Thanks, Walter. Just just a little bit about who Northwest Fire is and who I am. Uh, I'm not the handsome looking guy in the uniform in the picture. I'm the other guy. Um, but Northwest Fire District is just northwest of Tucson, Arizona, hence the name Northwest Fire District. Um, we're 10 fire stations, soon to be 12, uh, pretty fast growing area, about 125,000 people. Um, and we're an accredited agency. And part of that accreditation was having to assess our risk in our community. And uh, one of the ways we assess risk is by pre-incident planning. And in the summer of 2016, we put together a uh, an Excel spreadsheet that the fire captains could go out and ask questions and click values, and it automatically calculated a risk score for them. So our goal with pre-incident planning was to determine what the risk of these buildings were as we were inspecting them and adding assets um, to the map. So um, we tried to outthink Walter in the beginning, which was a mistake. Um, Walter's process is sound. If you start from a clean slate and use this deployment tool, it works very, very well. Um, we started off with a bunch of three ring binders and fire trucks. I'm sure a lot of you have the same situation out there where we uh, have 10 different 11 engine companies and not one has the same binder because they've collected information over time and put pen changes on it and so forth and so on. And we had about 1,300 building footprints drawn. Unfortunately, we don't have a building footprint layer in our county. So we went to our county and said, hey, what's up with this not having a building footprint layer? And they said, we're developing one and uh, we haven't got up into your area yet, but we do have 1,800 buildings in your area. So when we compared the two, we ended up with about 2,000 building footprints that between the counties and ours. And that was our starting point in March when Walter introduced this tool and said, hey, it's ready for you guys to use to, to draw these building footprints. Um, we use the pre-incident plan coordinator or ArcGIS Pro to draw the buildings. Um, there's a reason for that is because in our stations, our fire captains have used a program to draw the interiors of buildings and, and building outlines and so forth, and they don't like it. It's just a lot of work that they don't like to do. So we made the conscious decision in the beginning and said, hey, well, let's not have fire captains drawing building footprints. Let's just let them get out in the field and um, drop things onto the map where they're standing. So that's been a very popular decision. Um, every time you wanted to draw a building footprint, they thought back to the days when they were sitting at their computer in their office and uh, not being as productive as they could be. So right now, um, when I looked it up this morning, we have 6,510 buildings drawn in our area. Wow. We're pre pretty close to getting all the commercial occupancies documented. We've let some folks practice on drawing um, residences just for fun. So not all those 6,500 are commercial, but probably 85% of them are commercial. And uh, we're gonna limit our first year to just the high-risk buildings and go out and examine those, the high-risk buildings that we found last summer. Um, 6,500 buildings, 10 stations, three shifts, that's 30 crews that I've got to get out there. It's gonna take me a long time to get through all those buildings. So this was a, a screen grab of an iPad, and we uh, gave this application to one of our fire prevention inspectors, just gave him about a three-minute education on how this works. And he went out and he, he walked through this building, which is a CenturyLink telephone company building, and he said, hey, what could possibly be wrong inside of a, a telephone building, you know, a bunch of wire and electricity and so forth? Well, he found a lot wrong inside this building. In fact, he found two 40-foot-long uh, banks of lithium batteries that if you had sprayed water on them, you would have killed yourself. And uh, the one over here to the right is a 4,000-gallon diesel tank that runs their generators. So there's a lot of hazmat and a lot of danger inside this building. You can see it's kind of a dark pink color, which means it's a moderate risk. So if it's a dark brown color, it's a high risk. And you want to stop before you go in that building and think about a plan and not just run in and, and blindly get hurt. So that was our goal was to give this information to uh, captains to help them tactically. So you can go advance. So this is an example of, of one of our elementary schools. Um, you can see it's, it's kind of light pink. It's, it's all sprinklered 
Um, it's got a lot of occupants during the day, but at night it doesn't have any occupants. And if you look to the very northwest corner, you'll see a square building that is uh, actually called Building J. And nope, over there to the bottom, that pink one. No. Keep yeah. going. Yeah, that one right there is Building J. Did not exist on the hand drawn or the, the computer drawn pre plan that they had. It hadn't been updated in quite some time. And uh, this is the aerial photo in the background, which was critical to our process. So let me back up a little bit and just tell you what our goals were um, with, with Esri. The first goal was to take all of that information we have in three ring binders and on computer drives and on server shares and, and uh, document it and make a distribution system so that captains can get access to it in real time and then have everybody else's pre plans as well so that when they're second due into an area, they have the second due areas uh, pre plans. Um, it's handy for our battalion chiefs because they have five or six first due areas. Um, they can't have an eight inch thick binder to leaf through on the way to a call. Um, so this has proven very popular to access those those uh, diagrams, those JPEGs that we have of all of our our building our building interiors. So that J building on the end was kind of a surprise to the captain. He says, yeah, it's been a long time since we've gone through there. They walked around the building and they marked where all the electrical shutoffs were, where the control panel, the key box was. But if you look down here on the right, you'll notice something that, that's not unique to Arizona, but very popular in Arizona. Those are solar panels. And last week, Walter came to me and said, hey, what do you guys do about solar panels? And we said, Walter, we didn't even think of that. So you can't really shut off a solar panel. You can disconnect it from the power grid. But the only way to really shut off a solar panel is to cover it. Um, that's a pretty large solar panel there, and I don't know that there's a salvage cover that big on any one of our engine companies to cover that up. So it's a unique hazard. And for houses that have those on the roof, that's, that's a non-go on roof um, because of solar panels. So we, we're developing a method to document where solar panels are and where the disconnect from the grid location is as well. That'll probably be another utility shut off icon once uh, Walter approves it. So you can go to the next one, Walter. So this was the goal, and, and the goal, as stated by the Division Chief of Operations, was if I can't see it on my mobile computer, I don't want to look at it. And the aerial photo in the background was the number one thing that we tried to get out to folks. And uh, the problem is when you're pulling an aerial photo in from a server, which is what the county has, their pictometry photo is on a, uh, an image server, an Esri image server, you can't operate in disconnected mode. So that was a problem for us because we wanted to be able to walk away from the fire truck and use collector and collect all our information outside of the Wi-Fi bubble of the truck and then come back and sync, just like Walter showed you on his device. So we needed to have the source data for this aerial photo. And we went to Pima County and said, hey, we really want to get this spectrometry data. They've been very, very collaborative with us. And they said, well, bring us a five terabyte hard drive and you can have it. So brought a five terabyte hard drive to them. They gave us two and a half terabytes worth of data. And uh, if any of you are familiar with iPhone storage space, two and a half terabytes exceeds its limit by a little bit. Um, <laughs> so we had to make a tile package. And we, we formed a tile package that covered our first two areas and, and our neighboring fire department's areas. And that first tile package was 71 gigabytes. And we said, oh, that's even too big for an iPad. So we went back and we did about three weeks worth of clipping and extracting by mask and trying to get it smaller and just a mile outside the fire district boundary. And after all that work, it turned out to be 60 gigabytes, still too big for a 32 gig iPad. So fortunately, Apple has thought this through and they have now a 128 gig iPad. And we were able to take that 71 gig file and sideload it onto the iPad. It is rocket fast. You don't have to wait for tiles to download from an Esri image server. It's just right there on the local device. Um, you say, I want to go into disconnected mode. You sync. You go and you say, I want to load the base map on the device. And we've attained the goal of uh, having a geo-referenceable um, map so that they can drop things on the map where they actually are according to the aerial photo. So our, the, our three goals were to provide a, a method to deliver the content, which we've achieved. Um, to have a geo-reference, which is the aerial photo, which we've achieved, and to have a, a dislocated or a disconnected um, 
methodology to collect, which you've achieved. So we've, we're at the final part of the proof of concept phase. Um, we only have one of those iPads. We've, we've ordered four or five more to go out and start beta testing this. Unfortunately, right now in Arizona is not the best time of year to be doing this because it's 100 degrees and humid out. So in the fall, we'll probably hit this very hard. Um, and then over the winter, we'll get out there and start inspecting as many buildings as we can. So I think that's about it, Walter. Oh, here's that uh, that building. And the reason, the way we found out about this this building and what was inside of it is the the uh, resident uh, inspector walked in the door and he turned around and this little attachment was on the wall and he took a photograph of it with his um, with his iPhone and attached it and that had all of the interior layout. And as Walter says, if you have an evacuation plan of a building, get a snapshot of it because it's the floor plan and you don't need to go back and draw a floor plan. It's just right there. Um, unfortunately, that's not part of our fire code to have that. It's just a nice to have for a lot of places. Uh, but most of the places where you have a lot of occupants will have one of those posted on the wall somewhere. Uh, it's a good thing to grab. And this is unique for you guys too, Jim. You guys in in incorporated the um, uh, work workforce in assigning your pre incident plans, I believe, as well, right? We did. We actually took our, our spreadsheet that we used last year to figure out what the risk score is of a building and uh, put that into survey one, two, three. It took a little bit of work to get it to figure out the formula to give us the number to put in the risk box on the building floor plans or the pre incident plan. But uh, Tom actually figured it out in survey one, two, three. So we have a survey one, two, three task, and we also have a building uh, inspection task. So we took those two tasks and we combined them in, in workforce. And you can see this is the actually the second largest concrete plant in the country. It's called uh, Cal Portland Cement. And uh, they have 30,000 tons of coal on the ground just off to the left there that you can't see. Uh, furnaces. I mean, it's yeah, there you can kind of see where it comes in yeah, into the building over there. But it's a pretty dangerous place. And I'm not sure this is one of those places that you'd stop at the gate and scratch your head for a couple of hours before you went in there. Um, this is kind of our fertilizer plant. We wouldn't want to run in there right. unless we had a good chance of making a difference. So, uh, and you don't know a lot of the stuff that's in these little buildings. They have like 45 buildings in this one campus. You don't know what they are unless you go in and look at them. So um, we just did a basic run through, which was a two hour walkthrough with their staff. It wasn't enough time to get the inspection stuff done. So we've assigned, uh, workforce tasks for people to go back and spend a little more time in each one of the buildings and document what's in them. So that's a that's a big campus there. It's got fuel and powdered coal dust and furnaces and oil and just all kinds of nasty stuff there that just to make concrete you never expect it. So Jim, you know uh, you, you mentioned see, that you are in the pilot stage. What's your next step? Um, our next step is we have to acquire all of the devices that we want to use. We've, we've actually inspected our hydrants on uh, small iPhone 5s, and they're just a little bit too small to see the level of detail that we need. So we're going to buy those 128 gigabyte storage iPads, and uh, we're going to buy them a little bit at a time and get folks out there a little bit at a time. So probably by late October, we'll have everybody out and about with an iPad. Um, we've already started to deploy the pre-incident plan locator on their mobile computers because there's information that's in there today that they can use um, that could make a difference and save somebody's life. So that's uh, why it's important to get that out as quickly as possible. Uh, basically, we run it in Internet Explorer, and they use the CAD mobile uh, software, and they just flip back and forth between the two. It's real easy to use on a mobile computer. Um, we've got it deployed on Android devices, we've got it deployed on iPhones, we've got it deployed on those iPads. So uh, again, the aerial photo is what the limiter was for us. Um, as you can see, it really makes a big difference in when you're drawing building footprints and so forth. Um, you can see that building footprint's a little bit off because it was drawn with Esri's aerial photo. And that's yeah. just a different projection than what Pima kind of uses, so it's a little bit off. So we've been fixing those and putting them on top of the buildings. How, how has it been received by the fire, you know, the, the guys out in the stations, you know, firefighters, and are they, how are they receiving it? Are they liking it? They want to do it or not? Or how's that going? They think this is the killer app. They really think this is saving them a lot of work to multiple steps. Um, and they can have access to everybody's information, not just their station's information. Oh, and uh, it's proven very, very popular. Great. Well, great. Thanks for the uh, update on your program. Is there anything else you want to say in closing before we uh, transition? 
nope, I think that's great. Thanks a lot for sharing, you know, what you guys have done. And it's been also enjoyable working with you. I do appreciate your collaboration on these applications. At this point, then, I want to transition over to questions. And uh, see, Chris, um, I see that there have been quite a few people uh, asking questions through the chat. Are there, and I appreciate you answering them, are there any other questions that have not been answered? Yeah, there's quite a few that I thought were um, more targeted to, to Jim and his work, so I wanted to allow him the opportunity to answer. So he, he touched on it briefly, but I just thought he could reiterate. Um, what was the source for the aerial photography that um, they were using? Um, in 2016, May, Pima County did a pictometry flyover, and uh, they did not cover the entire county, so the areas that are filled in um, with the Pima Association of Government 2015 flyover, they cover more area at a lower resolution. So we've blended those two together and it's given us full area coverage. Um, they've got another flyover planned in May of 7, 18. And by October of, of 18, we probably will have another uh, more accurate one um, that shows more of the new development that we've got going on out there. But yeah, pictometry was the source. Um, you have to actually have the data. Uh, you can't just use Esri's online data or Google online data. You actually have to have ortho data to, to make a tile package. Any other questions, Chris? Thanks. Um, yeah, um, did, Jim, did you designate someone within your department to obtain all of the information and, and how much time was exhausted from their, their normal responsibilities? Well, the, the entire department for Northwest, the GIS department, is myself and Tom. Um, we have recently signed an enterprise agreement with Esri, so we're going to start training some other folks to use ArcGIS Pro, and uh, so spread the knowledge out a little bit and have a shift coordinator for each shift. So we've been working on this project for about nine years, trying different solutions, and we have made the most progress that we have in nine years since March. Um, using this, this Esri solution. So as far as time goes, it takes quite a bit of time. Tom actually works in a slower fire station, so he spends a lot of his time just drawing building footprints and gathering plans from folks. I've had some light duty folks that have gone around with the iPhone and photographed everybody's book. Um, we, we just It's been a, a variety of different things. I'd probably say you're never gonna have this project finished in your career. Um, because things change all the time. I mean, unless you have a very, very small town with a couple of hundred buildings, um, it, it's going to be an, 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 a, a repeating process every couple of years that you're going to want to go look at these places and see what's changed. So it'll never end. I mean, Esri's product may change, but the need to determine what risk is in your community is never going to end. And uh, people make changes to things that, that increase or decrease risk. So you need to be out there looking at that. Great. We've got time for about one more. Uh, there was a question. Okay. Um, let's see. I guess I would say, um, would you, Jim, would you have any recommendations for um, how Tucson Arizona's Fire Service could link their building footprint collection with what the, the local Tucson's building department is uh, collecting their footprints? Um, we actually have a, a login for the city of Tucson folks, an intergovernment login, and I haven't shared with them, hey, you can go in and add your building footprints to this, but our, our overall big picture goal is to make this available to the county at some point so that they can use their enterprise license and make it available to all the fire departments in the metro area and, uh, and let everybody drop building footprints because you never know where the wildfire is going to hit or the flood's going to hit or the plane is gonna crash, or the train loaded with Tomahawk missiles that they make in Tucson flips over on their track. That could happen anywhere in our metro area. And uh, to have information on, on anybody's department would be very helpful, not just for us, but for uh, federal resources or state resources that are coming in to manage a major incident. Um, we just had a pretty major incident on one of our mountaintops. We had a 50,000 acre wildfire uh, that threatened one of our communities up there. And that was a a big event here in, in Tucson. Uh, fortunately, the rain took care of that for us because we're in our rainy season. But things happen. I mean, even in Arizona, we don't get earthquakes or hurricanes, but we do get floods during the monsoon season. 
and wildfires and, and plane crashes. So those are three real things that happen here. And uh, to share that amongst everybody would be a great thing if you could do that regionally. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. I appreciate your help uh, and answering all those questions. I want to, before we close off here, give you an uh, audience a uh, list of resources that you can go to. Again, there's the link for the pre incident plan solution in the solutions.rgs.com space. Uh, the, I also want to let you know there is a meetup that you can register for that we do every month on different application solutions if you're interested in that. Uh, there's the link for that. Also, the GeoNet is a great place to go to answer questions or get feedback from users like Jim. Uh, that have done things or are asking questions about how to handle things like solar panels or whatever. Um, and then I also want to let you know about the public safety webinars. You probably already have got this link, but I want to make it available to you in case you want to send it to somebody else um, and remind you that there will be another webinar for fire safety on uh, November 15th where we'll be talking about how to implement a um, fire safety inspections using ArcGIS. So there are some resources for you and as uh, we'll also provide uh, response back to everybody uh, via email with uh, um, email addresses for Jim and myself. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you all for staying with us and listening to what we have for the pre-incident planning. And again, I want to thank Jim and Chris for helping out on the webinar as well. And I hope that you all have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.